Hi, and welcome to lesson eight in our compounds unit. Now that we've talked about naming and formulating compounds, we're going to end this unit by looking at some of the mathematical relationships among the elements in the compound. We're going to be dealing with a concept called the mole. Not this kind of mole, a different kind of mole. Let's go in and take a look at how we can use this when we need to figure out the masses of different compounds. So formulas tell us things, right? That's what we use them for. Specifically, they tell us how many of each atom is in a compound. It's important when we look at a formula to be able to figure out the number of atoms in a compound, but we also have to be really careful because parentheses can make things weird. When we have parentheses around any element, we have to multiply all of the elements inside the parentheses by the subscript that's outside of it. And if you remember back when we did ternary compounds, we would only have parentheses in any compound where there was more than one of the thing inside of the parentheses. Here's an example, aluminum nitrate. Can you figure out how many aluminums, nitrogens, and oxygens there are in this compound? Why don't you pause the video for a second and try it, and then we'll go through it. So within this compound, there's one aluminum. There are three nitrogens, because we have one nitrogen and a nitrate, and three nitrates. And there are nine oxygen atoms. Does that make sense? I hope it does. If you have any questions, write them down, and then let's go on. We've already been dealing with the concept that there are different types of formulas, but let's formalize that here a bit before we go in and look at the math inside of them. One type of formula is what's called a molecular formula. This gives us the total number of atoms of each element needed to form a particular molecule. This is only true for covalent molecular substances. Methane is CH4. It's made out of one carbon and four hydrogen atoms. Benzene is C6H6. It's made out of six carbons and six hydrogen atoms. I'm sure you can understand how this works. The other kind of formula that we've really been dealing with is the empirical formula. The empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms in the compound. This is true of all ionic compounds and network solids. What we show is what's called the formula unit or the empirical formula for that compound. Calcium oxide, which is CaO, has many, many calciums and many, many oxide ions repeating. But in order to get a handle on it, we just call it CaO, which is its formula unit, its empirical formula. The same is true for network solids like silicon dioxide. When we deal with molecular compounds, some molecular compounds can be stated both as empirical formulas and as their molecular formulas. And sometimes the molecular formula is the empirical formula. Methane's molecular formula, CH4, is also its empirical formula, CH4. But ethane, which has the molecular formula C2H6, has the empirical formula CH3. It's important to understand that molecular compounds can have different empirical and molecular formulas, unlike ionic compounds and network solids. Now that we have a handle on that, we can get a handle on this notion of formula mass. Formula mass is simply the sum of all of the masses of all of the atoms in one unit, either the molecule or the formula unit, of a compound. For the purpose of all of the math that's going to involve formulas, we're going to take our numbers to the nearest tenth. Here's a compound. It's called chloroform. Its formula is CHCl3. If we wanted to figure out the formula mass of chloroform, we can do it by summing the masses of all of the atoms in one molecule. Pause the video and try that on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So I'm just gonna make a chart in order to keep track. I'm gonna have my element, the number of elements in the compound, the average atomic mass for that element, and then a subtotal, which will then sum at the end to figure out the formula mass of chloroform. There's one carbon, it's got an average atomic mass of 12.0 AMUs, taken to the nearest tenth, and so its subtotal is going to be 12.0. There's one hydrogen. Its average atomic mass is 1.0, and so it's going to be 1.0 as the subtotal. And there are three chlorines. Chlorine's average atomic mass taken to the nearest tenth is 35.5 atomic mass units, and so its subtotal is 106.5 atomic mass units. I then need to add these all up in order to get the formula mass for chloroform, which is 119.5 atomic mass units. Does that make sense? You should be able to do this for any compound that you're given. Similarly, now that you know the rules for naming compounds and formulating them, I could give you the name of a compound that follows IUPAC rules, and you should be able to figure out its formula, and from that, figure out its formula mass. Formulas also tell us other things. Specifically, for our purpose, they tell us how many moles of atoms are in a mole of the compound. One mole is defined as 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of a substance. 
So for our example of aluminum nitrate from the beginning, if we had one mole of aluminum nitrate, there'd be one mole of aluminum atoms, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. There'd be three moles of nitrogen atoms, and there would be nine moles of oxygen atoms. Again, not this mole. A good question would be, well, why is this number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd? There's really no particular reason other than the fact that that's what it is. Atoms are incredibly tiny. And so it turns out that if you take 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of a particular element's atoms and you add it up, the mass of that amount of atoms happens to equal the molar mass of any substance. This notion of the molar mass or the grand formula mass of a substance is just how much one mole of a substance's particles weigh. That mass is going to be equivalent to the substance's formula mass in grams. That's incredibly important. And that's why the mole is so useful. If I want a mole of zinc atoms, I can go and get its average atomic mass, 65.4 AMUs off the periodic table, and simply weigh out 65.4 grams of zinc. That will be one mole of zinc. Similarly, 12.0 grams of carbon is one mole of carbon. 28.1 grams of silicon is one mole of silicon. That's what makes the mole so useful. It's an incredibly large number of atoms, but because atoms are so tiny, that number of atoms is the number that you need in order to generate usable masses of elements for the purpose of chemistry. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, you definitely want to make a note before we move on. Let's practice finding some molar masses. These are not in your packet. I'd like you to determine the formula mass and the molar mass of the following substances. Sodium hydroxide, chemical formula NaOH, and glucose, chemical formula C6H12O6. Pause the video and try it on your own before we go through it together. Let's do sodium hydroxide first. Chemical formula is NaOH. Now I can just go to my periodic table, find the masses of each of these substances, and add them all up. Sodium taken to the nearest tenth is 23.0, oxygen is 16.0, and hydrogen is 1.0. Add it all together, I get 40.0. If we're talking about formula mass, that would be 40.0 atomic mass units. If we're talking about molar mass, that would be 40.0 grams. If I go into my laboratory and I weigh out 40.0 grams of sodium hydroxide, I'll have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of that compound. Now let's do glucose. Glucose is a little bit more complicated, but not very. I need to go onto the periodic table and find the atomic mass of each of the elements. Carbon is 12.0, and I'm going to multiply that by 6. Hydrogen is 1.0, I'm going to multiply that by 12. And oxygen is 16.0, which I'm going to multiply by 6. I'm going to do all of this math, add it all together, and I'll get 180.0 as my answer. Again, if we're talking about formula mass, that would be 180.0 atomic mass units. If we're talking about molar mass, that's 180.0 grams. 180.0 grams of glucose is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of glucose. Do these make sense? If they don't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. You are absolutely going to need to be able to convert between grams and moles. It's a very common calculation in chemistry. Reference table T actually has the equation that's used in order to do this. The number of moles is equal to the given mass divided by the gram formula mass for the substance. Let's go and try some problems. Let's do a mole to mass conversion first. This is not in your packet. Determine the mass of 4.5 moles of sodium hydroxide chemical formula NaOH. Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So in this, I'm actually looking for the given mass in the equation from reference table T. Rearranging that equation, I get that the given mass is equal to the gram formula mass times the number of moles of the substance. Substituting in my values, 40.0 grams per mole, which we figured out in a previous problem, times 4.5 moles, I get a final answer of 180 grams. That is the mass of 4.5 moles of sodium hydroxide. Let's go the other way and do a mass to mole conversion, also not in your packet. How many moles of glucose occupy a mass of 500.0 grams? Again, pause the video and try it on your own, and then we'll go through it together. The equation I would use for this is the equation off of reference table T. Number of moles is equal to given mass divided by gram formula mass. Substituting in my values, 500.0 grams from the problem, and the gram formula mass of 180 grams per mole, which we calculated earlier, we get an answer of 2.778 moles of glucose, taken to the correct number of significant figures. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of formula mass. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. 
Make sure you can explain the relationship between the molecular formula and the empirical formula for any substance. Also make sure that you can determine the atomic mass and the molar mass for any substance. Finally, make sure that you can convert between a given mass or a given number of moles for any substance. If I give you one, you should be able to figure out the other. If you can do all of those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have here at the end. You can always leave them in the comments below the video or get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.